Hello, everybody. This is Earn Break, and I'm uh, at the BC Conference, and a big hello to everybody in Penticton and Costin Karameas uh, from the BC Conference. Uh, Pastor Greg Wellman asked me to share a few words, and I'd like to do that. I'm calling uh, on my message called uh, How to Be Perfect Without Trying. And so I'm trying to visualize you right now all looking very perfect. And I uh, can uh, see Pastor Greg and Debbie and uh, Connie, I miss you, being on the, uh, on the health committee. And uh, so I'm just uh, going to start right now by sharing my screen and uh, see if I can share what I can. Let's see. Hold on. Here we go. Okay. So you should be able to see that. And uh, it says, how to be perfect without trying. And it's uh, almost a funny title because it's almost like someone says, well, how can I lose weight without exercising or something like that? Is it like that? Well, yeah, kind of a little bit like that. And no. So let me share with you as best I can. But first of all, let's pray. Father in heaven, I do thank you for your love to us and for your desire to speak to us from wherever you are, which is everywhere, to our hearts. Oh, Lord, help us to hear your voice today and help us to understand a little bit more about how you work so we can be blessed by you, so we can in turn be a blessing to others. We thank you in the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, well, the topic is how to be perfect without trying, and I'm gonna begin with a question. Have you ever been in the woods and you see a bear coming at you? Now I'm told, I've never done this before, but I'm told that if, you, if this happens to you, that the bear would be more afraid of you than you would be of it. But what if it's a mother bear with cubs? Do you think the mother bear would be afraid of you at all? And I think the answer is absolutely no way. That mother bear, because of the cubs, and maybe it's uh, instinct or whatever it may be, will not at all be afraid of you, and you better run or stay out of the way because that mother bear is a bear. Well, I haven't had any experiences with bears, but I have had experiences with dogs. And uh, here in Berman University is where I had an experience with a dog I want to share with you uh, to illustrate a point to do with the title of our message. This is Berman University in Alberta. I went there after I was converted from atheism, not too long afterwards. And I spent a few years in this building right here called Maple Hall. And in the evening after my work was done, <clears throat> I go down to the library and I would uh, look at my watch and I would time myself to run to the highway and back. And the first time I did it, it took me 21 minutes to go up, the, uh, down the hill, up another hill, and then turn around the corner and up to the highway and turn around and come back. Well, after some practicing, I got it down to 19 minutes and then I got it down to 17 minutes. And I couldn't get it past 17 minutes. Uh, I, that was the fastest I could ever go. Well, uh, that changed one night. Uh, when I happened to be uh, jogging along, like I said, I jogged in the nighttime. Should have brought a flashlight, but I didn't. And along, as I was driving along, a dog came. His, it was an ugly looking dog, the ugliest I've ever seen. His back was up, his tail was straight, he was showing his fangs. He was worse than this dog even that you see on the screen. Now at that particular time, you could do fight or flight. Now, guess which one I did? Uh, yeah, you're right. I did, the, I did the flight. I just took off because I knew that dog was going to have me for a midnight snack. And so here I am. I reach down to the bottom of the hill and I make the corner and turn and look up at the college, up that hill and flat and then up another hill to get finally to the college. Now, remember it was nighttime. It was darker than this. And I really didn't know how I was going to get up that hill. The dog was chasing me, he was getting very close, and I knew I was going to slow down going up that hill. But lo and behold, something happened, I guess it was adrenaline, and I was able to just zoom up that hill almost effortlessly. It was just amazing magic that I was able to do that. And by the time I got up to the top, to where the library is, I turned around and I saw that I left that dog in the dust. Well, uh, I looked at my watch, and guess what? I did it in 15 minutes flat. I was so proud of myself. 
that I could do this uh, run in 15 minutes flat. I told everybody about it, but I could never ever do it again. I needed the dog to help me uh, go so fast. Well, that kind of brings me to another story about a dog and then I'll come to scripture. Uh, that happened in Alberta, in uh, Lacombe, Alberta, College Heights. And I moved from Alberta with my new wife, June, and a son, Michael, from Alberta all the way over to Botwood, Newfoundland. And in Botwood, Newfoundland, I was a young pastor. My wife was a young principal of a small school. And together, we would jog in the morning. Uh, just as the sun was coming up, we would go jogging. And um, this is not us, by the way, but we kind of looked like that. And uh, often, though, what we would do is we would jog in the streets of Bogwood early in the morning, no cars, very few cars, and the sun was just coming up. And I would always uh, jog on the outside, making sure that my wife was protected on the inside. Now, here's the road that we jog down. I'm gonna, I, I want to draw a description of it here for you. Here's a road, here's another road that turned left. And so here's two houses, and then here are four more houses. But what I want to show you is that these kind of dotted lines represent uh, fences, or white picket fences separating each of the houses. And here we are there, uh, jogging along, and we get to about where this fence is. See, June is the pink arrow, and I'm the blue arrow. And lo and behold, we hear this noise of a dog. It's barking. We don't see it, but we hear it. Then we look over to our left and we then see this huge, big, gigantic German Shepherd uh, barking. And it looks like he's running in his backyard toward the fence. And I was so glad that we had three fences to block his way from getting to us because it looked like he was a pretty vicious dog. But I didn't think of something, and that is that German Shepherds can jump over fences. And that's exactly what he did. He jumped over that first fence, he kept on running and barking, and then he jumped over the next fence. And at that time, I realized that this dog was going to attack my wife. He was making a beeline straight for my wife, and he was going to attack her, and I just could not allow for that. But watch the arrows. Now, I decide I'm going to go on the inside, and, and put the, the dog to me and so that my wife would be protected and I'd be in the, in, the, in the middle between the dog and my wife. Well, interestingly enough, as soon as I did that, the dog just stopped, just stopped. All of a sudden, just like, eh, it stopped. And for some reason, that dog must have known that I was not going to lose a fight with him. I, I, there might have been blood, it could have been his blood, it could have been my blood, I didn't care but I was going to stop that dog from jumping on my wife. Now, the question here again, fight or flight? Guess which one I did? Well, you better believe it. I was brave. I was a superhero. I was courageous. I was like Superman. I did not have any fear whatsoever. I was gonna tear that dog apart with my bare hands if I had to. Now, here's the question that I have, why? Was I able to be so fearless with that dog when I was so fearful of the other one? What made the difference? Why is it that I ran away from that first dog, that ugly little dog, and it was smaller than the big gigantic German Shepherd, what made the difference? Well, a lot of people, when I ask that question, they say, love made the difference. I was protecting my life the second time. Love was the activating ingredient that made the difference in my fear level, which made me fearless and it made me courageous. If I was filmed in a movie, that would have been my heroic moment right there. And love is what made the difference. Now, the behavior of being loving came without even trying. If someone were to ask me, did you make sure that you protected your wife? Did you make sure that you did everything proper and nice and good? I would say I wasn't even thinking of that. All I was thinking of is I love my wife. I don't want to see her get hurt. And the behavior just followed as a byproduct of my love for my wife. That's what I want to get to now when it comes to how we do Christianity. Okay? So let's take a look at a Bible verse. Perfect love casts out fear. 
as well, let's take a look. Um, take a look at this. The uh, fear is could be anything from mild anxiety to outright sheer terror. That's what fear is. Now, love, when love exists, it casts that out. Where love is the active ingredient in a relationship with God or with people, fear is not there. It gets cast out. As a matter of fact, you can put it on a teeter-totter or a seesaw and look at this. See, as fear goes up, love kind of disappears. And as love goes down, if love disappears and fear goes up, but on the other hand, if love goes up, if love is the, uh, is the active agent happening, then fear goes down. So you can see this, this inverse relationship between love and fear. That's what I want to talk about a little bit. Now take a look at this sentence on the screen. This is what happens. This is what people say too often as Christians. I am not good enough. I am not perfect. I'll never be perfect. Uh, it causes me strain and worry and anxiety. What am I going to do? I'm not good enough. And uh, they say something like this. It's hard work being a Christian without a lot of obedience stuff. And I could have said it's hard work loving my wife with all that obedience stuff. But you know what? It absolutely isn't. All that hard work is just nothing but a byproduct of an effortless byproduct of love, just loving my wife. And she loves me the same. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about that. Here's a Bible text which may worry some people. It's from Matthew. Uh, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 48, at the end of the, the book of uh, Matthew 5, the chapter of Matthew 5. And here it says, be perfect. Well, no wonder people get this idea they're supposed to be perfect. It even says they're supposed to be perfect. And then to, to add insult to injury, it says, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, that's like really, really perfect. How are we ever going to meet up to that standard? And so it causes angst, it causes worry, and in some people, sheer terror to realize that we'll never be as perfect as God, and yet God's going to judge us, and we're going to be lost, and it's going to be horrible. And so it, it makes Christianity, or that version of Christianity, an awful thing to be in. But it actually does say in the Bible to be perfect. So what gives? What's going on here? That's what I want to talk about. Let's begin with the first part of that passage there, Matthew 5, verse 43. Jesus is talking, sitting on the mount, and he says, You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You've heard that, says Jesus. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Which sounds like an awful hard thing to do unless you have supernatural power to do it. He goes on that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. So he's now saying, here's something that you need to do so you can have to be sons of your Father. That means to be like the same nature as your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In other words, our Father in heaven is good to good, good and bad people. He's good to everybody, no matter how good or bad they are. He just is. That's just the way he is because he's love. He goes on to say, Jesus, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Like that's, that's a normal, natural thing to do. Well, you're Christians. You're above what's normal and natural. You have supernatural power. You don't act like you only have natural power. He goes on, and if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? And then he says, right there, therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So this is where that, that perfection comes in. It has something to do with um, treating people who are both good and bad with kindness, with mercy, with uh, treating them the way God would treat them in, in a good way. Now, what should help us here? is a parallel passage in Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 27 and to 36. I'm not going to read from verse 27 to 36. You can do that. But it's very, very similar to what I just read in Matthew. But it ends with these words. 
Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. You would think he would say, be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect, to follow along what, what Matthew said. But Luke goes through almost the exact same things that Matthew does, but only he says, be merciful. Now, here's a little bit of how we can interpret the Bible. We're still going through the Bible interpretation in our Sabbath school lesson. To understand what one passage says, take a look at what another passage says in the same context, which is what this is doing. So it makes me wonder, does being perfect have, a, have something to do with being merciful? That's the question I ask. I want to pursue that. Well, I look up the word merciful in the Greek, in the Greek language there that it was written in by Luke. And it said, compassionate. That that word is the same word in Greek that's used for compassionate. So we could say, therefore, be compassionate, just as your father also is compassionate. That means the same thing. So now I'm thinking, does being perfect mean being merciful, which is being compassionate, as opposed to focusing on my behavior, which causes me concern because I'm not perfect. All right, so stay with me. Now I'm gonna add a couple of quotes here from, from Ellen White. Here's one from Acts of Apostles, page 551. The completeness of Christian character. The word completeness is also the word that's used for perfect. The word in Greek for perfect is telos, where we get television from, telescope from. It means to be complete. It means to come to the end of something and you're done, you have no more to do. And it's, you're perfect in that state that you're in. And listen to what it says. The completeness of Christian character is attained. When? When? When the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. The completeness of Christian character. In other words, my perfection. The, the thing I'm worried about. It's attained when I have the impulse to help other people. And it just springs constantly from within. The impulse. In other words, something that you do without trying. It's an impulse. And the impulse to help and bless others is what determines when you've attained your completeness of Christian character. Here's another one. The closer you come to Jesus. Now we have to put this in here. It's from Steps to Christ, page 64 and 65, because all this talk about being perfect makes us self-centered. It makes us think about me, my perfection, which I am not. And, and that self-centeredness is a problem for being Christian, because being a Christian means you're not self-centered, you're Christ-centered. So I want to quote this quote here for you. It's from Steps to Christ. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. Now think about that for a little while. You would think the closer you come to Jesus, the more perfect you will be. And so we come closer to Jesus so we can get perfect and we monitor our perfection by making sure that we come close to Jesus so we can behave correctly. But no, it doesn't even say that. It says the more faulty you will appear to be in your own eyes, which is really depressing, except for one thing. We're not saved by our own behavior. We're saved by Christ's behavior, right? So I'd like to read this whole quote now for you. The closer you, clum you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes, for your vision will be clearer. Of course it'll be clear. You're looking at Jesus. And your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. Jesus is the only perfect one. And yet God says through Jesus in Matthew 5, you be perfect. We know we can't be perfect, so what's going on here? The closer we get to Jesus, the more faulty we appear in our own eyes. How do we work out this whole perfection thing going on? This is evidence. What's the evidence? That we appear faulty in our own eyes. In other words, imperfect. This is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power. That the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. Let's get some more clarity here. Let's go to this one. This is my last uh, Spirit of Prophecy quote from Desire of Ages, page 641. When is God's mission for us accomplished or perfected? Quote, love to man is the earthward manifestation of the love of God. 
Love to man is the earthward manifestation of the love of God. When we love the world as he has loved it, not loving the materialism of the world, but loving the people in the world, that's what that means. So when we love the world as God has loved it, then for us, his mission is accomplished. We are perfect. When we love the world as God has loved the world, why we're fitted for heaven, for we have heaven in our hearts. So our focus is now on the love which has the outworking of the behavior, but we don't focus on the behavior, we focus on the love, and the love relationship. That's what I want to talk about. Now going back to that first John 4 quote, which I quoted already when I talked about love and fear. Love has been made perfect among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. In other words, no fear, courage, fearless, in the day of judgment, we're going to be judged and we will have boldness in that time. Why will we have boldness? Because as he is, as God is, loving, right? So are we in the world. So when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that we're supposed to be perfect as God is perfect, that's all connected up with God is love and love will love even the enemies, which we cannot do naturally. And it says, we will have boldness in the day of judgment, not because we've been so much perfect in our behavior, but our, perf our perfection has to do with our loving people, having compassion for people, having mercy on people. That's where it's at. That way, we will be like, like God. For as he is, so are we in this world. Going on in verse 18 of 1 John 4, there is no fear in love, but... Perfect love casts out fear. So there's an inverse relationship between love and fear. As fear goes up, love goes down. As love goes up, fear disappears. Because fear involves torment, whether it be anxiety or sheer terror, fear involves torment. And that's not what you have when you have love activated in your life. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So we, if we have fearfulness in our lives if we have cowardice if we're afraid if we have all these anxieties that go along that means we have uh, uh, more to accomplish in our christian walk i guess you could say um, now how do we get this love this is the answer right this the capacity to have love is the answer for all the problems that we have in our christian struggles how do we get that capacity to love? The answer is right here in front of you, 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. So if we can put ourselves in a place where we feel and sense the love of God toward us, then that has a reaction in us, and that causes us to have love back to him. That is the only way we're going to get that supernatural power to have the capacity to love is by putting ourselves in a relationship in a context of his love. Does that make sense? Now, if you want to have some help with this, uh, just email me at ebreak at bcadventist.ca. I'll put it on the screen in a moment. Uh, and ask me how to hear the voice of God. I have a handout which I can give to you, just some, some text I can give to you. And this, if you follow through some of these things, pick one of those things to do, then you will be in a sense experimenting experiencing god for yourself and you grow closer to god so email me if you wish to, to have that there it is there break at bcfs.ca well here's a car it's turned upside down and it just so happened uh that i was driving and i was in nanaimo just leaving nanaimo and i was on a school trip with my wife as a, a teacher from our avalon school there in port hardy and we're coming back from that school trip from Victoria on our way to Port Hardy. We stopped by Nanaimo and uh, we had a late night the night before and then we had just a, a heavy meal and now I'm driving and I fall asleep at the wheel. I go into the ditch. The ditch has a big field and we're bumping in the field. And my wife at that time was asleep, except at that time she just woke up. And she screamed, realizing that we are going 100 kilometers an hour in a big deep ditch in the field part that was next to the ditch. Well, immediately I woke up too. 
And I decided I need to get back up on the highway, which was about maybe 10 feet higher than I was. And so I went back up to that, into the ditch and up the side of the ditch and the car flipped over. And now we're on the highway, going down the highway, upside down with four wheels in the air. And it was rather, uh, well, fearful, I guess you could say. Meanwhile, my head smashed out the window and my head was being dragged along the highway. I won't describe the blood, but it wasn't pretty. And we finally grinded to a halt. We didn't hit anything. I was waiting for my leg to snap or something, but nothing happened. We just grinded to a halt with my head out the window. And at that moment, the uh, silence was uh, deafening and I called out to my wife and to my son, Michael, who was sitting behind me. I said, is everybody all right? And my wife, June, said, yes. And I was so thankful. And Michael said, yes. And I could tell he wasn't all right, but he was OK. And I was doing the worst. I had blood, and I, I was trapped. And if it weren't for my being uh, uh, pushed out the window, uh, half out the window and half in the car, I probably would have died but uh, with the crunch of the ceiling of the car above my head. And so at that moment, my wife, now recognizing that uh, the car could explode, that's what she was thinking. When a car goes upside down, gas leaks, and the gas pipe, whatever, you know, she didn't know if it happened or not, but she envisioned that the car was going to explode and she was going to lose her husband and she was going to lose her son. That was the first thing that came to her mind. She was upside down too. She kicked her door open. And then she uh, crawled on her hands and knees on that hard asphalt of the highway and on broken glass. And she came around to save her two men, me and her son, our son. And uh, she couldn't get me out at all, and, but she did alleviate Michael a little bit. Now, what I think is quite amazing here is that here she is thinking the car is going to explode. We're going to die, but she's going to die with us. And that's just the way it's going to be. Help did come, and we were saved and went to the hospital, and you know, it turned out okay. Um, now, here, here is my uh, question for you. What would my wife say if someone told her, in order for you to prove your love to your husband, you need to crawl on your hands and knees and go on hard ash, asphalt and on broken glass? What would my wife say to anyone who told her that's what you need to do to prove your love to your husband? She would tell them, and I'm sure you would too, that is a very twisted form of love. That is not how love works. You don't prove your love by going through suffering. You don't prove your love uh, in, in order to win the love of your husband, in this case, uh, by doing those things. But yet she did those things because she loved me. She was an amazing hero to me on that particular day. And she was willing to lose blood, which she did, and to even lose her life for the sake of saving me and our son, Michael. And so this too many times is how Christians often think of what it means to be a Christian, is we have to prove our love to God by behaving in a certain way. And all that proving our love to God, all of that obedience is just wearisome. What if we could find a way to do that obedience part of Christianity without trying? And the answer is that we can by having love. Love is what causes the behavior. Love is what we need to focus on so that the behavior will be caused. Let me go back to this picture. That's how I began. Uh, how to be perfect without trying. Now, there uh, is a couple. Looks like they're having some fun on the beach. That could be me and my wife. That could be you men and, and your wives. And uh, here he is, he's lifting her up. And what if we said to him, hey, uh, make sure that you follow all the rules and that you aren't tempted to let your wife drop. Do you think that would be a problem? No, it won't be a problem. Even if he lets his wife drop, he doesn't want to, he's not tempted to do it whatsoever. He loves his wife. He doesn't want to hurt her whatsoever. Uh, so his wife, on the same uh, token, was, was, let's just say we say to her, make sure that you uh, do all you can to abide by the right kinds of behaviors so that you can show that you trust your husband. And no, 
she simply loves her husband and she trusts him. You don't need to give her any rules and regulations. Love takes care of it. Maybe we can put it this way. When the law of love is activated, the byproduct is obedience to a thousand rules without even trying. Let me read that again. When the law of love is activated, the byproduct is obedience to a thousand rules without even trying. So this is what I want to be able to say to you. How to be perfect without trying? Put yourself in a condition, in a circumstance, in a context of love, where you are receiving love from God and where you are then able to have the capacity to love others. So in that particular context, love will be operating and will be powerful and the obedient stuff will just come without even trying. So think about that. And maybe I can just remind you again, if you want to uh, get some help with that and give you some ideas, uh, email me at ebreak at bcavenist.ca, stay on your screen. How do you hear the voice of God? So you can read that, it's just, I don't know, uh, maybe two or 3,000 words on about six pages or so, and read that for ideas of what you could do to put yourself into a context of a, an experience of a love relationship with God. Or you can also email me for uh, uh, just a small one-page thing called How to Overcome Temptation. And the idea there is, and the secret to overcoming temptation, is to recognize that overcoming temptation is just a byproduct of something else. It's just a byproduct. It's not what you focus on. You focus on the love relationship first, and the overcoming part comes as a byproduct without even trying. So give that a go. Uh, email me if you wish, and I'll send that to you. And right now, I think I'd like to close in prayer. God bless. Our Father in heaven, Lord, these are heavy things to talk about how we can be perfect without trying. And Lord, I do pray that you give us the sense of your presence in our lives and of your supernatural power of love working in us. Lord, let us have that. Lord, let us be so connected to you that we are above uh, natural things and into supernatural things. It's really because of our connection to a supernatural creator being, such as yourself. Lord, we come to you in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus. Amen. Well, God bless you, everybody. And until we meet again, uh, may God uh, keep you well. Take care.